Hello, everyone, and welcome to a special Facebook Live Ask the Stem Cell Team event. Um, I'm Kevin McCormack. I'm the Director of Communications and Patient Advocate Outreach at CERM. That's the California Institute for Regenerative Medicine. And we're California's stem cell agency created by the voters of California back in 2004 to fund stem cell research here in California. And over the last 15 years, that's exactly what we've been doing. In fact, just yesterday, our governing board approved another clinical trial, this one targeting um, uh, breast cancer that has spread to the brain, uh, to metastases to the brain. Um, that's the 56th clinical trial that we funded over the last few years. And obviously, we hope to get some more of those going. But we're fortunate today to have two members of the board that approved that trial yesterday joining us today on a panel. Um, unfortunately, uh, Joe Panetta, one of the other members of our board, wasn't able to make this broadcast. But I'll introduce you to our panel members in just a moment. But first, I wanted to talk about the purpose of this uh, Facebook Live event. We want it to be interactive, and that means we want you to be involved, you to be engaged, and to pose comments and questions. So if you post those in, in Facebook, we'll get to as many of those as we can during the broadcast. I also want to remind you that even if you can't stay for the whole broadcast, you'll be able to see it again later. Uh, as soon as it's over, it gets archived on our website, on our Facebook website, and so you can go there to uh, videos, and you'll be able to see not just this particular Facebook Live, but also all the, the other Facebook Live events. Um, and so with that, I'd like to bring our guests into the, uh, to the lobby and introduce those to you. First, we're joined by Dave Martin, and he is the co he's a long history in uh, biotech and, and, and research um, at Chiron Genentech. And most recently, he is the co-founder and chair and CEO of Avid Biotics. And uh, we're also delighted to be joined by Dr. Anne-Marie Dulege. And she, again, has a kind of a, an illustrious career in research after beginning her career as a pediatrician. They're both members of the CERN board. And Anne-Marie is now the executive vice, vice president and chief medical officer at Rigel Pharmaceuticals. So we're going to begin with um, both our panelists talking about their experience, their background, their history, and what brought them to the CERN board. And we're going to begin with Dr. Dulej. Hi, good morning or good afternoon, everybody. Um, and Kevin, thank you very much for inviting me to represent the ICOC or Independent uh, Governing Board of the CERM. I'm uh, Dr. Anne-Marie Duliege. As Kevin mentioned, I am the Chief Medical Officer at Rigel Pharmaceutical, a public biotechnology located in South San Francisco, in the Bay Area. In terms of background, I'm a pediatrician. I, I train specifically in pediatric immunology, and now I continue to practice once a week at Stanford um, in the subdivision of pediatric rheumatology. So I continue to have a clinical appointment. That being said, early on in my career, I decided to go into research and particularly in the biotechnology sector, more specifically in drug development. And I've joined several large companies such as Genentech in the past, as well as Chiron, and then went to smaller biopharmaceutical companies, Affimax and now Rigel. My passion is about drug development, really bringing new options um, to patients and to physicians in order to have a better choice of potential treatment for their patients. So I'll uh, stop here. I've joined, uh, maybe let me just say that I've uh, joined the ICOC or the governing board of the CIRM about seven years ago as an industry representative. And I'm delighted to be part of the group, of a group that includes um, not only other industry representatives, but also university representatives, often deans of medical schools, as well as patients advocates. That's it, uh, Kevin. Great, thank you, Anne-Marie. And uh, now we're joined by uh, Dave Martin. And so, uh, Dave, it's all yours. Thank you, Kevin, and I appreciate the invitation as well. I am a, uh, a recent, uh, Comer to the uh, oversight committee. I've been on the uh, committee for just under two years now. Uh, my background is I uh, grew up in southeast Florida, uh, and you might see a, a dermatologist mark here from a few days ago from being out in the sunlight without a sunblock when I was a child. Uh, my father was a pediatrician, and I had a younger brother who had an inherited disease, <clears throat> uh, which was 
diagnosed. In fact, I and a childhood friend of mine diagnosed it in uh, 1966 as a Lash Nyan syndrome when I was at NIH, and so was my childhood friend, uh, Bill Kelly. That was, had a major impact on my interest in medicine uh, and research. So I, I went to MIT, Duke Medical School, did uh, internship and residency in internal medicine, and then went to NIH, as we said, uh, as a yellow beret to avoid the Vietnam War. Uh, I was there three and a half years and then moved to San Francisco on the faculty of UCSF, where I had the remarkable experience of experiencing the development of recombinant DNA technology. Uh, I was there from 69 until 1982 when I joined Genentech as the first head of uh, research and development. And I was there until Roche bought it the first time in the fall of 1990, went to uh, DuPont Merck uh, as head of R&D and then returned to Chiron, as uh, Kevin said. Uh, and then I've started a couple of companies in the interim. Um, my interest in the uh, oversight committee and stem cells actually uh, stems way back uh, to the uh, middle 70s when I started working, uh, collaborating with a uh, faculty uh, co-member at UCSF, Gail Martin. Uh, Gail and I are not related, nor am I related to her husband, Stephen Martin. And I have followed the field sort of vicariously for a number of years and then was delighted to be invited to enjoy uh, the membership in the uh, Oversight Committee. And I continue to uh, head and manage uh, the research mostly now in oncology and immuno-oncology uh, at uh, what was formerly Avid Biotics and now is called Xiphos as we divided Avid Biotics into two companies. And we are in uh, South San Francisco, and I live in Marin County. Kevin? Great. Um, thank you, Duke. As someone uh, with a very fair Irish skin, I sympathize with your, kind of, your sun problems. We didn't have quite as much sun as in Florida, but we got just enough to kind of cause a lot of damage to ourselves as well. So. Um, yes. If we could um, bring Dr. Dulej uh, back into into to the room now, um, I wanted to start by asking you, Amory, um, what do you think? Because you're a physician, not just a physician, but a practicing physician still. What do you think that that helps bring um, to to the table that maybe uh, people in just who have just done research maybe don't always have? No, oh, absolutely. I, um, you know, value the the flexibility that I have in my professional life to do both clinical research as well as, as you said, uh, practicing uh, pediatrics. And the value of that is uh, I keep on, you know, knowing really what are the most important questions that patients have, that their parents may have, how to engage into a dialogue about these questions, also how to know how to examine a, a patient, how to prescribe, what's the structure of a hospital, how the system works, and having still an active uh, foot in the door of the clinical world, I think is invaluable to put in balance this with the research perspective and my research activities. Um, quite by chance, uh, maybe not by chance, um, we just got a question from uh, Lady Annalisa Wilson who said, I used to work in pharma, uh, but decided to go to medical school and I'm wondering how I could incorporate my interest in regenerative medicine and pharma in my residency career path. Um, how realistic is it to continue research once in residency? Um, that's actually uh, probably a, a difficult thing to say, to do. And the reason is, is because the residency program is so intense that maintaining a research activity together with the, the, the better part of the residency program might be a little bit challenging. What I've seen rather is people taking a sabbatical year during the program and then joining either a company or a, a, a team in, in an a, in a university setting and being part of this. But I don't know that people have been able to really maintain both doing such a, the, given the intensity of the residency program. 
Great. Thank unless, you. by the way, unless they have decided to do an MD PhD, which is a different story. Right. Um, I'd like to bring uh, Dave Martin back into the into the room now. Dave, what are your thoughts about that notion of trying to combine both? I mean, you were uh, you went to medical school, so how difficult is it to try and be a, both a, a practicing physician and a researcher? I think it's 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 not too difficult to if if you have the right boss, I guess, uh, to combine research and uh, clinical practice. Uh, but during a residency, it's very difficult. And I'll just tell you one of the problems that I had as a mentor for some residents when I was at UCSF as a professor of medicine. Uh, medical residents would want to spend you know, a few months in the lab to learn about research. And even if they were going to take six months, uh, they wanted to maintain their clinic. And the experience that I had as a mentor is obviously research gets tough and experiments don't work and it becomes frustrating. And as soon as that happened, the residents would say, oh, I have to go to clinic. And they'd leave and they go to clinic. And as a result, they had lost the continuity of a full-time commitment to the research. Research is too difficult. Uh, laboratory research and life sciences is too difficult not to be fully committed to it, particularly when experiments fail, as they more often do than, uh, than are, they are successful. So that was one of the problems. And there, there are solutions to that. And as I think uh, Anne-Marie mentioned, uh, sabbatical is certainly one way to do it. I was fortunate enough when I was at Duke to join a program called a research training program that was run, it was set, sponsored by the National Science Foundation. It was imagined, designed and developed and managed by Jim Weingarten the late Jim Weingarten. Jim died about a month ago uh, in his middle 90s. He, in the interim, was a professor of medicine at Penn, at Duke, and was director of NIH. Jim set up this program, and it took eight medical students and eight uh, postgraduates, that is, uh, physicians who had completed their uh, couple of years of residency, put us together and for a year. And there was didactic training, and then there was laboratory training. That was the precursor of the MD-PhD program or the medical scientist training programs. That is one way to do it. And that is, you have to have a dean who says, OK, you or a departmental chairman, you can take off a year and learn how to do research. And I do not want to see you on the wards during that period of time. And those people, uh, both the uh, undergraduate medical students and those who had finished their residency, now the track record is quite remarkable. Most of them are retired, but they almost all remained in academic medicine or in the last 10 to 15 years, a number of them went into industry once industry became more academic. So there are ways to do it, but it is difficult to do it on a very short-term basis. Right, and you, you raise a really interesting point there, which is that there's constant failure. I mean, so how over the years have you managed to retain your enthusiasm, retain your sense of possibility and optimism when so many experiments that you're doing seem to either fail or just kind of run into a dead end? I've been, I've been doing this, I finished my residency in 1966 and I've been doing this ever since. And one of the really important things is to surround yourself with really important people, uh, particularly recent trainees, uh, postdocs, graduate students, to, who, who can provide the stimulation and the motivation for one as a mentor to keep it going and try to help them solve their problems and keep them motivated. So I think that, that surrounding oneself 
being in the right environment, I guess, is the best way, both uh, the physical, uh, financial, and uh, with the right individuals uh, is really important. I can also add it helps enormously to have a spouse who understands and supports that. That I know. I don't know much about science, but that bit I do know. Um, Amory, if we could bring you back in now, and if you could talk about um, your experience in, in joining the board at CERM, what was, was it when you were asked, and, and what happened once you got there? Were you surprised at the kind of the level of work or the kind of the, the amount of work that was involved? Uh, so not really. I was actually introduced to the ICOC and explained really what the role of the ICOC was. So it was pretty obvious, you know, what, what I had to do. And certainly uh, bringing my industry experience in terms of uh, ensuring that the judgment of the CERM in terms of which projects to be granted and those possibly not to be granted right now, but uh, sent back with comments to improve their proposal. All of that is also not dissimilar to what I'm doing in my industry uh, work as well. So that was actually uh, pretty easy. I very much enjoyed the dialogue that we had between the members, the employees of the CERM on one hand, and then other colleagues on the governing uh, committee, as I said, whether these were colleagues from industry or um, university-based um, colleagues, mostly deans of universities. And I think we always learn a lot from patients' representative, uh, something that I had done in industry because we do have uh, patients representative and community representatives in, in our among our collaborators. So I was very pleased to be able to extend that to the ICOC. One, one of the things that always strikes me is just how hard it must be to make decisions um, about which projects to fund and which not, because the need is so great over so many different areas. Yesterday was relatively straightforward, I think, at the board meeting in terms of funding the clinical trial. Mm -hmm. um, but how do you how do you deal with that when there are so many projects that you think there's a real need for, there's a real desperation for, a real hunger for, for, for new approaches to treating those, and yet you know that there's only a limited amount of funding available? Uh, sure, sure. That's definitely the very role, the responsibility of the collaboration between the CIRM on, its, on one hand and then the ICOC on the other hand. Uh, the, the CERM goes through the process of a very detailed, extremely well-organized reviews of each proposal for funding called the Grant Working Group, and then makes a proposal to the ICOC, the governing uh, body or the oversight committee, which Dave and I are, are part of. And then we evaluate the quality of not only the grant, but mostly the quality of the review, and put that in balance between two other aspects, one, the, the unmet medical need, which is very often very high when it comes to stem cell research. And on the other hand, the amount of money that has already been spent in this particular field of research, and then the amount of money that is left uh, really uh, uh, for the CERM to, to, to spend. And it's that dialogue between the CERM and the ICOC where very often uh, patients, uh, grant representatives and patients representative also come and add their perspective that allows us to make hopefully the very best decision possible. Great, thank you, Anne-Marie. Um, Dave, if we could bring you back into the room now um, and talk to us a little bit about um, what you see your role as being on the board, but also, I mean, you're, at, you're one of the kind of the more, um, should we say vocal members of the board? You're always asking questions. What What is it that, that kind of drives you and makes you think, is this worthy of, of, of some funding, knowing that we have a limited amount of money available? It, it's, it's trying to understand the potential uh, of the applications of stem cell technology and knowledge. I, I, I followed the field for a long time, as I mentioned, since uh, the middle 70s when I started collaborating with uh, Gail Martin. And the issue then was that we had to use a, a, a surrogate uh, stem cell. There were no cultured stem cells. Although we knew they existed, we didn't know how to culture them. And I remember Gail Martin making a statement and, and publishing saying, you know, if we can ever get to the point of being able to culture stem cells, human stem cells, that's going to change everything. And she was so right. 
now what, what I can do sitting on the, this oversight committee is see that change. And it is remarkable. Um, and, and it's so exciting. It just, uh, there, there are very direct connections uh, with, uh, with actually an article in, the, in this month's uh, Nature Biotechnology uh, that just came yesterday. And what I was doing back in the uh, middle 70s. Uh, and and the, the excitement for me uh, of this oversight committee is I get to see some of the very best science in the field. And I get to see the cutting edge, if you will, of the application of this science. Uh, and, and yesterday, uh, the meeting was a really good example that a number of neurologic applications that I could hardly imagine, uh, applications, for instance, an application, I guess I, I let me just a quick, quick anecdote. Uh, in 1980, I was on the, uh, what we call the RAC, the Recombinant Advisory Committee of the National Institutes of Health. And at that time, uh, the RAC committee reviewed every, every experiment almost, application that was being uh, requested uh, from NIH or for NIH funding. We reviewed it all. And I made the statement, and I this was about probably late 1980, that I thought we were going to begin seeing applications for gene therapy to correct genetic diseases. And, you know, at, at that time I was heading medical genetics, uh, adult medical genetics at UCSF, uh, participated in the pediatric uh, medical genetics clinic with Charlie Epstein, et cetera. And I was, I was just so convinced of the need and the technology was rapidly advancing that I was incredibly naive because I, I suggested that we were going to see an application in a year. And I thought maybe my lab might be one of those applicants. Yesterday, and, and, and actually, as I mentioned, reading the new Nature Biotech, the, the application now is straightforward and uh, for many diseases. The successes are remarkable. Uh, the, uh, an, an, an important news article in this Nature Biotech is that, and actually I brought it with me, uh, and, and I just was reading it last night. And here's one that um, bubble boy gene therapy reignites commercial interest. And the commercial interest is in gene therapy to cure diseases, genetic diseases, for instance, in children. And one of the points that's made in this news article is that the enzyme deficiency, the inherited immunodeficiency disease called adenosine deaminase deficiency, which I was working on in my lab, and that's what I thought was going to be the first uh, application in a year for gene therapy, uh, has now with the at, at UCLA and ORCID uh, Biotech, they have treated 20 children with adenosine deaminase deficiency who were in effect bubble children and they're all cured. That's remarkable. That, you know, that, that has taken, you know, 35 years and, and it's to, to be able to witness that and, and watch it. And, and by the way, uh, Don Cohn, who was the investigator and the founder of this little biotech company, Orchid, has been funded almost exclusively in this arena by CERM. That's an example of what sitting on this oversight board does in terms of providing the continuity and the history 
and this remarkable success. And the same is going on now for other immunodeficiency diseases. These are diseases in which the children uh, have totally defective or severely compromised immunity and they're put in a bubble uh, so that they don't get infected because they have no protection from most infections. And they, they, they are, but other uh, diseases of this same sort are being treated and cured. It just so happens that the adenosine deaminase deficiency is probably the second most common one. Uh, and I actually had another experience. This has been quite a remarkable uh, week personally for me. Um, and it gets back to the, the, the whole issue of, of what is CIRM doing and why is it important? Um, I was on the telephone I just take a couple of minutes and just just tell you this because it, it it's it, it's amazing. I was on the telephone with uh, our daughter, uh, uh, Jillian, uh, on Sunday, and she has uh, two teenage girls, uh, a thirteen and a almost sixteen year old uh, daughters. That uh, she wants the older one to uh, see what what we're doing in the lab, why I am doing research as a physician and why being a physician is an important part of that, as Anne-Marie said. And so we were trying to arrange and, and have arranged for uh, my granddaughter Lillian to visit uh, the lab and, and understand what we do and what motivates us, as, as Kevin was uh, mentioned. And she, uh, she said, you know, I want her to understand uh, and, and hear about uh, a patient that you and Art Amon had at UCSF who was immunodeficient and had a, an enzyme deficiency very much like adenosine deaminase and how involved you were in that child and trying to figure out exactly what could be done to treat her. And then she started crying <laughs> and she was crying because she remembered when that child died. We had her in the hospital and she got chicken pox and in a week she was dead. And Jillian, who was 13 then, 12 to 13, heard all the talk at home and my getting up in the middle of the night to go to the hospital and then came home and said she died. That disease can be cured now. Uh, that doesn't happen uh, with support of CIRM. That the technology is there, the stem cell technology, the ability to genetically engineer stem cells from these uh, very sick immunodeficient patients and just make a difference in these children. And it becomes very emotional uh, for me when I actually can follow the track through the cure of adenosine deaminase deficiency and the skid bubble boys and girls. And in fact, the adenosine deaminase gene was first cloned in my laboratory. Um, and one of my former postdocs in my lab at University of Michigan, Scott McIver, is very much involved now and is mentioned in this Nature Biotech article about attacking other immunodeficiency diseases with the gene therapy and curing them. So being able to sit on this oversight committee and witness this and participate in it and try to add my perspective of understanding and balancing the issue of how important is it to cure this disease? How common is it? How do we prioritize uh, all these needs with limited funding. Limited funding is really a big issue right now as uh, has become apparent very much on the public is that we are now, CIRM is now uh, at the end of this uh, Prop 71 uh, bond issue that provided the $3 billion funding starting in 
what was it, 2006, I think, we are, we have really made progress. CIRM has really made progress. Uh, and my role is really minor in this, and I feel really remarkably privileged to be able to witness what is happening in the stem cell biology field. Thanks, Dave. I think I think all of us who are involved in this feel privileged to to be part of this. It's like having a front row seat to history, and we're seeing so many changes. As you talked about the um, the development by John Cohen and his team at UCLA of this treatment for SCID or severe combined immunodeficiency, um, bubble baby disease, where he um, I was talking he was giving a presentation at a, a patient advocate event we organized at the ISSCR conference in Los Angeles just a couple of weeks ago. And they've now treated 55 children with this condition. And again, it's a rare condition. Many of these children have come from all over the world. So they've treated 55 children. More than 20 are now cured that we know of. And that means that the more than five years past treatment, um, all of the other children are doing well, which is remarkable when you think about it. And we've also funded research with two other clinical trials uh, targeting other forms of skin. And again, they're really helping people, making a difference in lives of children and family. Children who might otherwise be dead are now facing, are now have an opportunity to lead a complete life. Um, so it's quite extraordinary. I'm gonna put up the, um, the, a link to the article that you were talking about just earlier. And, and hopefully if people want to read that, they can see that themselves. I think what's also exciting about this work is that when it's used on one application, even if it's a particularly rare condition, it then can be used or adapted for other conditions. And you talked about that. I know that Don Cohen and his team are now using the same approach that they used in, in helping treat and cure children with SCID to try and develop a cure for sickle cell disease. And this is something that affects around 100,000 people here in the US, uh, most of them African-Americans. Right now, there is no treatment except a bone marrow transplant, and that can only be done in, in rare cases. So clearly, having something that could treat that would be remarkable. And CERM, we've actually joined with the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, a part of the NIH. And we've created what's, in many ways, a unique partnership to help kind of co-fund some of this research. And, and as part of the Cure Sickle Cell, disease initiative and we're hopeful that within the next few years we'll be able to find projects, find clinical trials that can perhaps turn the tide against this, this nasty and deadly disease. Um, Anne-Marie, if we could bring you back into to the, to the lobby now because one of the questions we got earlier from um, someone on the line was that um, I'd like to know more about a realistic time frame for a retinitis pigmentosa uh, treatment and this is not necessarily about retinitis pigmentosa but I would like to because we're already funding um, two clinical trials in that. But the time frame that it takes to get these therapies, even the most promising mm -hmm. ones, into a clinical trial. If you could talk about that, because I think sure. there's a lot, of, a lot of hope, obviously, but maybe sometimes unrealistic expectations about how long it takes to do that. You're making a good point. So the whole development field, development of drugs, uh, is composed of several steps. And even if I'm going to focus on the clinical steps, which is after a potential a drug, a potential treatment has been identified as potentially promising, gone through what we call in vitro testing, then gone through animal testing, gone through some level of toxicity evaluation, then it makes the step of first dialogue with the, with the FDA to ensure that there's enough data for this potential treatment to be tested in healthy volunteers first, but quite often now more directly into patients um, at what we call directly into phase two trials. And then once there's enough information about, or minimal information, I would say, about the safety of this experiment, as well as its potential effect in patients, then it goes into larger studies, often referred to as phase three trials, which in some cases can be even controlled, whether it's placebo and times not placebo. Um, and then the, the dialogue with the FDA continues in putting together uh, the results in form of a dossier that is then reviewed by the FDA. It usually takes um, up to a year, can take uh, uh, less if the results are quite spectacular and if the FDA really wants to make it available sooner. And then we're getting to the end of a process. That I've described a process that on average can take up to eight years, and that's an average. Uh, but when there is really phenomenal results, certainly some steps can be shortcut to make sure that uh, promising, very promising treatment can be made available to patients earlier. And there is also 
uh, other other ways where that can happen. But the bottom line is eight years, anywhere between six to 10 years is an average for drug development. And uh, again, you can see that the first results can be very promising, but we need to confirm the validity of these results through a large group of patients. That's great. Um, we're getting some questions, including um, what are the biggest changes that you've seen in regenerative medicine over, say, the last 10 to 15 years? Um, I'm, I'm happy to say two. One is the ability to use adult stem cells and can be reverted into a pluripotential uh, cell. So from a technical standpoint, that expanded enormously the field of stem cell research from what was initially limited to uh, fetal stem cells or embryonic stem cells to now using adult stem cells. So many more possibilities. That's one. The second uh, major changes that has happened and all of that CIRM, in all of that CIRM has played a key, a key facilitating role was to get potential stem cell intervention into clinical trials, which is something that David and you uh, have mentioned also previously. And now we see not only just phase one trials, the first step of it, but as I referred to earlier, phase two and potentially up to phase three trials, which then would be done in collaboration with industry usually. And so we're approaching this field of phase two and phase three trials, getting closer and closer to really uh, potential stem cell based treatment being made available to patients on a larger basis. And that's very exciting. Great. And uh, Dave, if we could get your thoughts on that as well. I, I guess the, the, the most impressive part is it's real now. It's not just imaginary. Uh, the, the, uh, the IPSC, the Yamanaka uh, Nobel Prize uh, winning work is, as Anne-Marie said, absolutely key. So is the ability <clears throat> to what we call transduce uh, a stem cell uh, efficiently. And this is based on years and years of work uh, to, to develop viruses uh, that can be crippled so that they can't cause disease, but use some of the mechanism uh, that viruses use to infect cells and carry their own genes into a cell so, they, so the virus can replicate. But to engineer, for instance, uh, the lentivirus uh, that causes uh, AIDS, uh, HIV. And that is now one of the several but quite efficient processes for adding genes or or, or in the case of uh, applica applications of CRISPR technology, being able to subtract or uh, modify engineer genes, edit genes, if you will. So if you when you begin to combine uh, the, the, the uh, ability to generate stem cells from all sorts of different, what we thought were fully mature, differentiated cells uh, from, from an individual and create a stem cell for that individual, be able to engineer that cell uh, and then be able to transplant it back into uh, the uh, original donor or patient. That's a remarkable event uh, or process. And I think that, that as a result, what has happened is that many of the uh, projects and programs supported by, <clears throat> by CIRM are now gene therapy projects. <clears throat> and that is that the, uh, the, the cure uh, or the modification of a disease is dependent upon treating the disease with a gene but putting the gene into a stem cell and a stem cell it is essentially defined uh, functionally by its ability to generate many offspring, many replicate cells that can differentiate into a cell that carries out a very special function. And so you, you sort of integrate those 
technologies and, and remarkable advances. The several that I mentioned are primarily in the last decade, but there are a number of technologies going on that, that occurred before that, obviously recombinant technology for manipulating DNA, uh, the ability to sequence uh, genes and entire genomes, that is the, the full complement of genes in a human, uh, now in a day for a thousand dollars, that's a remarkable advance that just is one of the important supporting technologies for what's going on in the stem cell biology. And, and what's so interesting to me is having lived long enough to witness uh, all of these. Uh, and I was even alive at the time that uh, uh, Watson and Crick and, uh, and, and Wilkins and uh, uh, Rosalind uh, actually discovered the structure of DNA is all of this is coalesced in CIRM. And CIRM is essentially funding the applications of all of these technologies uh, using stem cells, engineering stem cells to treat human disease. And in many cases, as we've already mentioned, to cure them. That's great. Uh, Amory, if we could um, bring you back in now and, and get you to talk a little bit about uh, one of the questions we're getting is from uh, James Stewart, who says that now that some funding for research projects is running out, um, what could be the impact on the field of stem cell research as a whole? What's the kind of things that we that may not be able to be funded if we're not around to help it? Um, indeed, uh, there are still many grants that have come to us at all stage, preclinical stage, what we call translational stage, very much what Dave referred to as the, the ability to understand a disease and come up with an intervention. How do you prove that? And then we're getting, we're certainly not getting short of clinical trials, uh, requests for funding clinical trials. And so what will happen if we can't find a follow-up to CIRM is that this will for sure slow down the research. At a critical time, the time of clinical trials, the time where truly we can now better understand if we can cure this, this diseases in these patients. So what we're doing is currently trying to see if there's a follow-up to uh, the CIRM uh, grants in either via a new funding, a new state funding, or some other form of collaboration because it would be too bad if things start to slow down at a time where they're really getting in an upward, upward slope of research. And if you could follow up that talking about what do you think if we don't get refunded, if we, if we do run out of money, and obviously we're, we're scheduled to run out of funds for new projects by the end of this year, um, what do you think our legacy will be? What do you think the legacy of CERM will be? Multi, mul on multiple fronts. Uh, for one thing, the uh, the proof already given the result that we start having in clinical trials that stem cell research can work and can be based to treat some patients. So just this very concept. Second, the collaboration that has happened now across uh, various centers in California, we call them alpha clinics, and they work together and they collaborate on clinical trials to start to accelerate the process of uh, clinical development, which I described as potentially very long process. And then third, a collaboration beyond California with other researchers, either US on, on a US basis or even at times internationally. So the impact of CERB has extended way beyond uh, the borders of California. And, uh, you know, we, we will have this legacy for sure. Great. And, and Dave, if we could bring you in and get your thoughts on what, what the, the legacy for CERM will be. We hope it won't be um, that we hope we'll go on for many more years. But obviously, if, if we do have to kind of sunset, what, what do you think the legacy will be? I, th I think a very important contribution uh, that will have, we hope, a very long half-life uh, is training of... Uh, young physicians and other basic and, and basic scientists about stem cell uh, technology, its applications, uh, the development of uh, and, and the continued advancement of the technology. So I, I think a major legacy is going to be all of the the, the young people uh, who, as a result of CIRM, 
either some direct funding or simply working in a laboratory that has been funded by CERM, those youngsters will continue uh, hopefully expanding the, uh, the application of stem cell technology to the improvement of human health. And I think that's, that's going to be increasingly difficult without CERM because of the uh, reluctance uh, of the current administration uh, to allow the use of embryonic stem cells, which are an important, not only tool, but contribution and component of the cures. CIRM has been funding embryonic stem cell research, not just the induced pluripotent stem cells, uh, but that I think has really helped enormously mounting and climbing this mountain, but we're not anywhere near the peak yet. We just can show that we're making remarkable progress and hopefully that momentum would be carried forward by other entities, uh, for instance, in the sickle cell uh, phenomenon, which I think is also uh, greatly due to uh, Bert Lubin's work at uh, Children's Hospital in Oakland. Uh, this is this is already working. It's already shown. There are already patients treated with sickle cell disease uh, and hopefully are cured. It's not just admitting to the hospital to get over a crisis. Uh, that's where we want to go. And so it may be that there's enough momentum and CIRM has shown that this can work, that that will be part of the legacy. We've shown it's feasible. Great. Thank you. Um, we've got a question here, and we talked about, we touched on this a little earlier, which is um, Kathy Jean Schultz says, other than the FDA approval process, what are practical measures that are being taken to address unethical practitioners whose bad surgeries are giving stem cell advances a bad reputation and making forward research difficult? Where are you throwing that one? I'm throwing that to you. <laughs> I mean, this is something obviously that we, we, we face a lot at CERN. We're always trying to raise awareness about the dangers of some of these predatory clinics who are offering therapies that are unproven and unapproved that haven't been shown to be either safe or effective. And in contrast to the work that we approve, that you approve on the board level, um, which has gone through rigorous testing and obviously has to go to the FDA and prove that as far as we can tell, we, with everything we've done, it looks and seems safe and it looks like it has potential to make a difference. So, so what else? I mean, as in, in kind of the wider field, what do you see can be done to maybe kind of raise awareness about this or maybe even crack down on these things? Well, there is some legislation uh, within uh, California uh, underway, and I don't know, you're probably more aware of the state of that, status of that, uh, Kevin or Anne-Marie, than I am. But I know that there has been attempted legislation to essentially put such entities out of that pseudo business. I mean, it's a business for them, but it, it is not, it, it's not scientifically validated, which I think is crucial. And it, as you say, it, it's unethical because of the misleading of patients and in a number of cases harm. I mean, they're, they're, I, I know that there've been patients uh, who have lost eyesight uh, because of uh, essentially a stem cell quack uh, injecting material into their eye and vision is lost, not improved. So I think that legislation is one form. The, you know, California has uh, actually a state FDA or a, a state equivalent of the FDA. Uh, and it does some inspections of facilities, but I don't think that that agency is active in uh, a, looking at practices uh, versus facilities. And I think that's one potential uh, approach for the state of California. Many other states have such activity. The uh, limitation that the, the Food and Drug Administration has is that they uh, are, because it's a federal agency, 
they are authorized only to deal with interstate activities. So that, for instance, if an agent is being made in Texas and shipped to California uh, the, the, and used, for instance, for an intervention uh, in a human as a drug-like uh, material, then the FDA can step in. But activities within the state, within any single state, uh, where no component has crossed a state line, uh, those are uh, not subject to the FDA regulation. So I think the states have to pick that up and, and require uh, evidence of validity and safety. Great, thank you, Dave. Um, you're right, we have been involved in some efforts to tighten up legislation here in California. We helped um, draft a bill last year um, that required all these clinics that are offering these unproven, these predatory clinics to put up a sign in their waiting room or somewhere where patients could see it to say that these treatments have not been approved by the FDA, these treatments have not been proven to be either safe or effective. Um, we've also been working with some other legislators this year to try and get um, a committee together to look at some of the practices that are going on and maybe they're going to craft something that really will help kind of clamp down on some of the, the bad actors that are out there. I think that legislation is currently on hold, but obviously this is an area that we have a deep interest in and we work with um, our legislators to try and draft something that does have some teeth and will hopefully uh, in the end produce some results. Uh, we're getting another question here from uh, Jason Tung and I'd like to bring you in, Anne-Marie, uh, to, to talk a little bit about this. Um, he's saying CERM has clearly shifted its focus towards supporting primarily translational and clinical stem cell research in order to develop cures for patients. If CERM is refunded, can you comment on whether its focus will remain the same or if there's concern that its lack of support in basic research will hamper the amount of new approaches that can reach preclinical or, or clinical stages? I'm sorry, can you just repeat the question? I couldn't quite hear it very well. Is it the concern that we will uh, uh, fund less preclinical research or less clinical research? I think it's the concern that because in the last year or so we have kind of shifted our focus away from funding more basic research into trying to kind of channel what remains of our money into translational and clinical research mm -hmm. because obviously those get therapies to patients faster. But that um, that approach will continue if we were to be refunded, say, in 2020. And I know that uh, talk of about a ballot initiative mm -hmm. that will be on the ballot in yeah. November of 2020 with, uh, for $5.5 billion. Mm -hmm. If that were to happen, would we keep our focus on the kind of the, the end stage, the translation or clinical stage, or also kind of re-engage at the, the discovery or basic level? You know, very likely if we have, uh, and we hope, to be funded again one way or another, we will continue the work in um, these three different but continuous directions the preclinical basic science uh, uh, aspects of the research, the translational aspects of the research, and clinical development. In life, in industry, in academia, and at CERM, they go together. While we are trying to make sure that uh, any uh, promising opportunities goes to the clinical stage of development, the one in patients, the testing in patients, there will always be a focus and a passion for new areas of research in basic sciences. Uh, that will not go away. If I may add, um, uh, Kevin, I'd like just to add something to the previous question about what's the responsibility, who is managing the information about really uh, this uh, misinformation, uh, significant, serious, dangerous misinformation about stem cells um, treatment in patients. And you had, you correctly mentioned uh, not only the FDA, but, but CIRM as a, an important responsibility. If I may add, patients advocacy group have also a very significant responsibility here to provide the correct information to other patients who are suffering from these diseases and may not have the ability to fully know and understand what's at stake here. Where patients advocacy group have become incredibly uh, well trained now, well informed about the risk of unproven medication, medicine, and that's their responsibility to inform patients as well. Great, thank you. And obviously at CERM, we work with a lot of patient advocacy groups and they're, they're doing as much as they can to raise awareness because they know that the, the future of potential um, therapies might be jeopardized if um, people start to feel that stem cell therapies are dangerous or, or potentially deadly because of some of the incidents that we've seen happening in some of these clinics around the country. As Dave mentioned, the, the three women in Florida who were left blind 
after going to a stem cell clinic and getting an unapproved treatment using their own cells. Um, clearly, tragedies like that can have a bad impact and a bad uh, influence on people's attitudes towards stem cell research in general. Um, but as we get towards the end now, Amory, I'd like you to maybe uh, think about, um, so what, what are the biggest challenges facing the field as a whole uh, in the coming years? Um, I think the, the biggest challenges is making sure that we defined a pathway for development that on, on one hand provides enough safety data about stem cell research, but is not too slow of a process so as to delay the availability of a promising treatment to patients. So trying to walk on this really fine path, fine line of having enough safety data, but then at the same time accelerating the process to make sure that these treatments are available to patients will, will continue to be one of the challenges that we face. Great, thank you. And Dave, if we could bring you back in and get your thoughts on the same question. What are the biggest challenges facing the field as a whole? Well, I think one is the, uh, the scalability. And that is, for instance, uh, being able to scale the application of the technology to more common diseases than, for instance, uh, treating a, a child uh, with a, a bubble, boy or bubble, uh, girl. Uh, sickle cell is an excellent example. We actually uh, also uh, heard a, uh, a proposal to fund yesterday traumatic brain injury, uh, which is incredibly common uh, a, a disorder, as you can read about, but it's not just uh, the NFL, uh, what they call uh, TBIs or, or the, uh, the war uh, TBIs. Uh, the other is uh, with the scale uh, scalability, and that, that almost certainly, as Anne-Marie mentioned earlier, is going to have to be uh, in, through the commercial entity, through industry, is to reduce the cost. Because you can't, when you scale, you can reduce cost, but you can't reduce cost without scaling. And I think for this to become, for, for the stem cell uh management of diseases, uh, it really is going to require a, a lot of technology development. Uh, and, and part of it is, as Anne-Marie mentioned, to reduce the, uh, the, the, the time to get an approved product, uh, which means generally having to uh, use or, or, or study fewer patients than traditional drugs. Uh, that fortunately, in some of the gene therapy studies, uh, there was a recent uh, therapeutic intervention approved with 35 patients. Now, now in some cases, that can be half of the patients in the US uh, have to go into a clinical trial in order to get an approval for the, uh, to use the, the, the therapeutic for the other half. Uh, but it, it has to be scalable, it has to be affordable. Uh, the advantage is from an economic point of view, what is the value of such therapy is if it's curative, then one doesn't have the, uh, the lifelong burden of uh, repeated treatment and complications of treatment uh, if there is a cure, for instance, trying to treat immunodeficient patients uh, and treat their infections and give them uh, antibodies every month, uh, you know, intravenously, et cetera. Those costs go way down. Uh, but I see th those as the, the major challenges. That and continue to advance the, the technology, the vector systems, uh, the understanding of how to manage stem cells, et cetera. Great, thank you, Dave. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have available. As always, the hour flies by. We have a lot of topics that we just don't have time to get to. Um, but I would really like to thank our, our two panelists, uh, Amory Dulege and Dave Martin, for their thoughts, their insight, uh, and just their passion and commitment to this field. I, get, I have the great good fortune of being able to work with them on a fairly regular basis and, and see the kind of the power of thought that they bring 
to these projects and, and, and make sure that when we fund something here at CERN, we fund the very best possible work. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to, to carry on doing that for, for many years to come. Um, there's a lot more information on our website if you want to find out more about some of the clinical trials we've been funding, uh, some of the most recent clinical trials and some of the work that both Amory and Dave talked about. Uh, go to our website and the, the address is up there, cerm.ca.gov. And you can also go, if you didn't manage to kind of catch all of the information in this uh, Facebook Live event, you can go to our website, uh, sorry, to our Facebook page, and, and it'll be broadcast there, um, archived there immediately after this ends. Um, and now I'd just like to thank you uh, for tuning in, for posting questions and comments. And if we didn't get to it, I apologize. We'll try and get back to those at some future broadcast. Um, and now I would just like to say thanks for joining us, and we'll see you at the next Facebook Live event.